All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this very special event with Peter Asher. We hosted Peter back in March, and it was hands down one of the best events I have ever hosted. And little did we know we were sending our event season out with Bang. I'm so very honored that he's chosen to celebrate with us again. And his singing Lady Godiva with the Unlikely Strummers was just magical. And if you haven't seen it, I would recommend going on our Facebook page and watching it. Um, I do have a couple housekeeping items to start with. If you lose your connection or your video or your sound, just exit out of your browser completely and jump right back in. And it'll straighten everything out. So we're gonna try something a little different with the questions. Peter, I would like to, if you are up for it, you can put your question or comment in the chat that you have a question for Peter. And I will then from the chat, invite you up onto the screen. So then you can ask the question yourself. If you would like me to read the question, then you can put it in the ask a question box, which is down in the bottom. And you can also upvote questions and they'll float to the top. Uh, there's a green button in the bottom. I highly recommend you click on it and purchase a copy of the Beatles A to Z. Peter has very kindly agreed to sign and personalize book plates. So when you purchase a copy from us, you will get a signed and personalized book plate. Um, so that's it. So I will lock you away. No, so I just want <laughs> everyone to just, <laughs> the comments are catching my attention. Um, so when you see the invite, It'll, it'll be a little notice from Crowdcast inviting you onto the screen. And so you just want to click to accept to allow Crowdcast access to your camera and mic. And we do have a zero tolerance policy for harassment of any kind. So just behave, be nice, be kind, be respectful. <laughs> Peter Asher is with us this evening to celebrate the paperback release of The Beatles from A to Z, where he takes readers on an alphabetical journey of insights into the music of The Beatles and individual reminiscences of John, Paul, George, and Ringo. His legendary music career began in 1964 as one half of the singing duo Peter and Gordon, who amassed nine top 20 records during their career. Their debut single, A World Without Love, a song given to them by Paul McCartney, went to number one in over 30 countries, including the US and the UK. In 1968, Mr. Asher became head of talent for the Beatles' newly formed record company, Apple Records, where he found, signed, and produced James Taylor and worked closely with the Beatles on their individual projects. As a producer, Mr. Asher has worked with many legendary artists, including Linda Ronstadt and James Taylor, who were on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine with him, and has been awarded 37 gold albums and 22 platinum albums in the US and many more internationally. Mr. Asher has produced 13 Grammy award-winning recordings and in 1977 and 1989 was honored individually with the Grammy Award for Producer of the Year. He won a further Grammy in the category of Comedy Album of the Year for his production work with Robin Williams. In the New, York, New Year's Honors List for 2015, Peter Asher was awarded a CBE, the Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth for his input to music. He continues to perform primarily with his multimedia show, Peter Asher, a musical memoir of the 60s and beyond. And he also tours on occasion with guitar great Albert Lee as an acoustic duo and with old friend Jeremy Clyde of Chad and Jeremy. Peter Asher met the Beatles in the spring of 1963, the start of a lifelong association with the band and its members. He had a front row seat as they elevated pop music into an art form. And he was present at the creation of some of the most iconic music of our times. The Beatles from A to Z grows out of his popular radio program From Me to You on Sirius XM's The Beatles Channel, where he shares memories and insights about the Fab Four and their music. Here he weaves his recollections into a whimsical alphabetical journey that focuses not only on songs whose titles start with each letter, but also on recurrent themes in the business Beatles music, the instruments they played, the innovations they pioneered, the artists who influenced them, the key people in their lives, and the cultural events of the time and also including which animals were in each song. If you can match Peter Asher for his fresh and personal perspective on the Beatles, and no one is a more congenial and entertaining guide to their music. And now here he is back with us, sort of, well, he's in California, we're in Plainville, and it is my distinct honor to welcome back Peter Asher. 
Maybe. Thank there. You. Hello. Thank you so much. That was an amazing introduction. I should take you everywhere. It you was should. a pleasure. It's, it's, it's very good to see you again and, and nice to be back. And, and thank you. And thanks, everyone, for attending. I much appreciate it. I see quite a few names and, and well over 100 people. It's very exciting. And I'm delighted to, to be part of this. Oh, we are completely delighted to have you back. So what have you been up to since we welcomed you back in March? Well, interesting, you know, because of course, originally I was supposed to be doing a whole bunch of gigs and like everybody else, life kept getting canceled in, in sections, you know. Well, we'll move everything to October, you know. Oh, we'll move everything to December. You know? Oh, we'll move everything to the beginning of next year. But, it, you know, the, uh, things that maybe, I suppose, next year, maybe things will start to settle down. I was even supposed to be hosting a couple of cruises, you know, and given the history of this plague in cruise ships, that didn't seem like the most sensible thing to do. So uh, I still keep taping the radio show. We've done uh, almost 200 now, which is crazy. It's like, wow. four, it's like four years of me rambling on. And, and, uh, and I, I've been in the studio... Uh, on a couple of projects, you know, doing the, the in a way that's uh, that fits all the current protocols and and parameters. I just finished a, an album, oddly enough, with James Taylor's sister Kate, who I made a record with uh, all those years ago. When I signed James, I signed both of them, and uh, we've just made a 50th anniversary album together of the of the album we did all those years ago. So I've I've stayed extremely busy, and I consult on a lot of projects and stuff. But you know. I do miss uh, seeing people. One of the reasons I like going out and doing gigs and being on the road is that, you know, because we play obviously relatively small places. So it's entirely feasible to actually meet people afterwards and chat and things like that, which I, which I very much enjoy. Yes. So I'm I looking forward to that resuming, you know, whenever it does. Yes, I do. That I mean, the energy in that room when you were there, that was, that was, it was magical. No, it was great. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I love doing all that stuff. It was great. So, um, so how did you come up with the idea of organizing your book from A to Z? Well, as you point out, it, it, it stemmed from the radio show. And the radio show, the, the idea was just born of really a desperate search for ideas because, you know, the radio show can be whatever I want it to be. Um, mm. They just said, you know, the, ma the mandate was, you know, well, you know, talk about Beatles stuff and play some Beatles records and or records related to the Beatles because I play their influences, people they influenced and vice versa. And so what that means is, of course, it's fine for, you know, the first few, it's fine for the first couple of dozen maybe, but after a while you're going, oh my God, you know, you played every, every Beatles song there is and you've told every story you can dredge up from your fading memory. And, and so, uh, at a certain point, you're going to go, now what? So I was really just looking for a way to reapproach all those songs and that music and their career in a, you know, from a different perspective. So I settled on the alphabet, really stealing the idea from Sesame Street. You know, it, it really, it wasn't like I had a, a list of songs in, in alphabetical order so much. It's not supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, encyclopedic in any way. It was more like, well, what if we just look at the letter and see, first of all, obviously song titles, but also people, places, styles of music, um, and all kinds of stuff. So, and obviously, you know, when you're in the A's and the E's, it's all pretty easy. By the time you get to the, the, the Z's and yes. the X's, it's pretty tough. You know, there, there turned out to be two Beatles Z tunes, neither of them anyway well known. And beyond that, I was stuck as, as to where, where do I go with Z and things like that. So it proved... It was sti it, it it stimulated um, my powers of invention only because I was getting desperate. So that's and that's that's where the alphabet came from in that context. That is fantastic. And how did you solve for Z? How did you solve for X? I, it was not well, Z. Uh, a, a couple of interesting ways. I might have talked about this before. I don't remember. But uh, well, let's take X for one example. Um, I I was completely stuck, and I suddenly realized that that I could talk about X Beatles. Mm. Um, and of course, every Beatle became an ex Beatle. So it wasn't just Pete Best. It was, you know, Paul and George and John and Ringo because they, you know, all became ex Beatles. And, and, uh, and I even tentatively mentioned ex wives, you know, of which there are a couple in the mixture. So, so that, the, the, that extension, that slight cheat of, of saying that X includes EX, you, you know, I was able to get away with that. And actually, it's one of the only times I, I did take uh, advice from, a, from a, a fan because 
they said we you know somebody wrote to me an email saying you know we we know you must be wondering about what on earth to do when you get to x and and do you did did you realize that um uh, that that a, a song that did they did in fact write a song entirely based on radiography of and i went what do you mean and they said well you know let's not forget that they wrote a song about they you know they they wrote a song about i'm looking through you and if that doesn't apply to x rays <laughs> what does it apply to you so right and, and i have the englishman's love of a corny pun so so I, I I went to that one too. So at least I knew I could play. I'm looking through you and make a a really lame X-ray technician job joke, which I did. So so things like that, you know. And and the other the, the Z thing, I I thought of two. Um, one specifically was the the zebra crossing, as we call them, in, in uh, outside the EMI studios, you know, across Abbey Road, the one that they famously had the photograph taken crossing, and 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 of course I realized that. If you walk to Abbey Road Studios, you are obliged to cross that road at the zebra crossing. So talking about zebra crossings, which I did, entitles me then to, to, to basically talk about any song I want to, since they were all recorded in that particular street. And I also decided to invent a Beatles zoo, a virtual zoo containing every animal that showed up in, in the Beatles song. And there's lots of them. You know, there's a- yeah. There's a crazy list of animals, some of which are obvious. I mean, everyone knows there's a walrus, you know, and a raccoon. But but uh, there's there's a, there's a lot more than that besides, you know, there's there's cats and dogs and uh, dogs with specific names like Martha, dogs of particular breeds like Hey Bulldog and and so on. And and of course, the Beetle Zoo also contains a very substantial aviary, in which there is not only a blackbird but a bluebird, and a bird that can sing. And so on, you know. This is, so anyway, I, I by stretching the, my license a little bit, I was able to come up with stuff to to cover every letter. Oh, it is so much fun. So, um, and I actually I learned that you, um, you had a bookstore. You actually yes, owned I, a bookstore, I, but instead I of I a did. cafe, yours had an art gallery. Yes, actually, in two separate buildings. Um, we started the the, the company was called Indica. And we, we, a name we took from the plant, cannabis indica, with which some of members, may, some of your audience, may be uh, vaguely f uh, aware of. And and uh, and so we we opened the bookshop first in Southampton Row in London near the British Museum, and then we opened the art gallery um, in uh, Duke Street, St James, sort of off Piccadilly. And um, we, uh, two friends of mine and I did, ran it together, and and Barry Miles, who's who's a author actually, um, you probably have. He wrote the Paul McCartney biography and a book about the sixties and all that stuff. A very mm -hmm. good writer. Um, he was in charge of the bookshop. Uh, John Dunbar was in charge of the art gallery, and I was partners in the whole thing and would work in. I, I must admit, I'm more keen on books than art, so I I worked in the bookshop whenever I wasn't on the road. But that was exciting. It was great times and. And, you know, the bookshop was, we were trying to be quite sort of beat about the whole thing. You know, Allen Ginsberg came and did a reading there. William Burroughs did a reading there, um, things like that. And it was, that was all very exciting. And then the art gallery became famous, of course, because it was at, at, the, at the opening of her show to which we invited the Beatles um, that John met Yoko for the very first time. And of course, when I say that, some people, I, I did, I said that in the show one time and somebody <laughs> jumped up and went, it was you, you, know, you broke up the Beatles. And I, to which I say, no, I didn't. Uh, I, I thought Yoko was very cool. She was in many ways ahead of her time and she was cool then and she's cool now. So, but uh, no, I didn't break up the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even imagine the people that you would be able to invite to your bookstore. Like, that yeah, is it was, fantastic. It was, it was it became a cool place yeah it was fun all right so tracy has a question here um and she says has paul told you not to talk about a particular topic no no <laughs> why would he do that that's a great answer not at all but all it's, right. a good, it's a good question um it's a good question which he told me never to answer no he, he didn't um, <laughs> no um no there's not there's there's nothing uh, you know i if I, if I don't want to talk about something, I just don't. But I haven't. I've never received instruction or advice on that question. That's excellent. But it's a good question. It is a good question. Um, I'm sure he trusts you enough to 
Um, let's see. All right. So Peter, this is a question is from Mike. Uh, he says he's looking forward to hearing all your Beatles stories. The one time I saw you perform was at Radio City Music Hall, singing with Linda on her Mad Love tour in 1980. Wow. Could you please give us an update on how she's doing if you have time? Of course. Um, she is in good spirits. She's an, an utterly remarkable woman. And I will here put in a plug. I had nothing to do with making it. But if you haven't seen the documentary about Linda that was on PBS first, and now I think it's everywhere. You can find it on all the usual spots. It's brilliant. And if you think you know about Linda, you don't, and you should watch it. I mean, she's not only the, the most extraordinary singer it's ever been my privilege to work with, but is a ridiculously smart, interesting, amazing woman. As you know, she has this horrible disease. It's the supranuclear palsy thing, which is like Parkinson's, but even more unpleasant. And But she's she's holding up well. She's in good spirits. She's still brilliant and, and one of the most well-read and well-informed people I know. She, you know, but tragically, she can't sing. So, which is, you know, pretty depressing for, for someone if i could sing like linda i'd be heartbroken <laughs> if i just couldn't do it yes. anymore and now the whole world is heartbroken that she can't sing but um mm -hmm. she's she's okay we speak often and indeed when 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 it makes sense to fly flying up to san francisco to, to say hello to linda is very high on our agenda oh that's so good to hear thank you for that question mike that was a great yes, question indeed. um let's see so here we've got a question from e um, hello, the first album that I ever purchased was a Peter and Gordon album. What was your best experience when talking to a fan? And what was the most inspiring experience? Wow, that, that's that's a good. tough one. Um, I You know, talking to fans is always interesting, even when they tell you about something they don't particularly like. You know, <laughs> so if they, uh, it's, it's always interesting. And there's no doubt, you know, human nature deems that, you know, hearing someone tell you that they like your work is exciting it's fun it's you know i i would be lying if i said i didn't care i do um you know so someone comes up and says you know indeed it, it reflects on you know when gordon and i decided to get back together which was after 37 years of, of not singing together um and we decided to try this one gig that we've been invited to do a benefit show and you know, it, it, the relationship with fans is always so interesting because I didn't know if anybody was going to care. You know, I really didn't. And the fact that there were devoted fans who had actually, you know, you'd see people in the audience who'd sing an old song and they'd be sort of crying a bit, you know, and and they'd say afterwards, oh, that True Love Ways was the song I you know, when I proposed to my wife and this that, and the other. And it's like, so it's, it's exciting. So I, I do find every encounter with a fan um, interesting, exciting, and yes, sometimes inspiring. I can't think of a particularly, particularly great example of of inspiring. I think just the fact that that, that validates your efforts, that validates what you're trying to achieve, and and especially if somebody sees what you were trying to do, they go, "I I love that album because it felt like you were trying to say this or do this or do mm. these songs a certain way," and, and you kind of go, "Wow, it was all worth it." Somebody gets it out there, you know, and and yeah. that's. That's it's beyond in, inspiring. It's enthralling. That is that is yeah. When somebody gets it, yeah. Um, so this is from Deborah. She says, "Hi Peter, I missed seeing you on the canceled Flower Power cruise, but look forward to seeing you on the FPC 2022." Yes, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> she loved this book, and she hopes to get it signed on the cruise. You can get the book plate in the meantime, Deborah. Um, yes, by the means. Is, yeah. Do you and Sir Paul get together anymore? Only by chance, you know, by occasionally we were some of, I mean, last time I saw him was, uh, they had the thing for the release of the new version of Abbey Road, um, which was not long before all, the, all this, you know, not traveling started. Uh, there was an event in, in London for the release of the album. And I went, flew over for that and saw Paul there and we talked for a bit. So it, you know, we both uh, do a lot of other stuff. We don't, you know, hang out necessarily. But do we run into each other? And do we always do we always embrace and say, "Let's get together sometime properly"? And then the next thing you know, we're we're in thousands of miles apart, doing something different. So, not a whole lot. But are we still in touch? Do I still consider him a dear friend? And the answer is yes. And and I do also remember to thank him from time to time because, you know. Um, 
Well Without Love, of course, the song that he wrote, um, not intending it for us, you know, hoping, I think, maybe the Beatles were going to do it, but John didn't think much of it, and they didn't do it. Um, and when I asked him if we could do the song, he said, absolutely, yes. It, the, so for him, it was a relatively casual, yeah, we're not doing it, you know, take it. But um, I think it was the Grammys a few years ago now, when it was the year that people were making a fuss about the, one of the Beatles' 50th anniversaries, either Ed, the Ed Sullivan show or, you know, some significant moment in Beatle life that was had happened 50 years previously. I did say to him, look, I know everyone's all excited about the 50th anniversary of whatever it turned out to be. But, you know, I said, I also want to thank you. This is the, this year is the 50th anniversary of when I heard, heard Well Without Love. And you said, yes, you and Gordon can record it because that clearly changed my life forever. And I want you to know I, I am, I'm in your debt. And he said, thank you very much. <laughs> no, that was that, but it's you know um, a relatively what didn't seem like a huge event at the time, but of course in terms of the direction my life took, it is a huge event. Wow. Okay. So I'm gonna let's we're gonna ask. Um, so Rob, Rob, you wanted to come on screen. I'm going to invite Rob up. Great. I'm gonna try that up. All Thanks right. So Rob, you're you gonna get an invite to go on the screen, and we'll see if he joins us. This is very cool. And someone else has actually asked if you would play the ukulele for us. Uh, I don't have a ukulele up here. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. My banjo lele's downstairs somewhere. That would that would be a bit of an adventure. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I, I seem to have a guitar up here, but, but I don't see. You can see the guitar possibly, but no, no ukulele. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. I think we can forgive you for that. <laughs> But I must say, uh, another reason not to play the ukulele is it would be impossible to beat the experience last time when we had how many excellent ukulele players? A dozen or many. so? Yeah. Cassie, put in the chat, how many ukulele players did we have? And they're actually doing something on our porch. They're doing the, they're filming on our porch. 30, 30 ukulele players 30. we have. Wow, I, knew, I knew it was a crowd. I don't think there's yeah. a word for it, is there? Like a, well, you know, a pride of lions or a, you know, lamentation of, crows or whatever it is i can't remember yes. but we need one for ukulele players for sure we should okay so we're going to make that up today that's okay be <laughs> all right the collective, <laughs> the collective noun for, for 30 yeah. ukulele players <laughs> yes excellent so it's i guess it takes a little bit of time um but we yeah, will get rob let's see what else we have in the um oh, the black, someone's talking about the black rose album that's relatively obscure um oh wow Oh, for J.D. Souther. J.D. Souther, it's, it's, it was, it's a good record, but it wasn't a big hit record. So the lineup of musicians that played on those tracks is stellar. Do you have a particular story or memory from that experience? Yes, it was, it was fun making that record. I don't know if any of you know, some of you definitely will, but some of you may know who J.D. Souther is. He's an extraordinary songwriter, um, wrote several songs that Linda did, um, like um, Pray for Love, wrote several songs that were huge hits for the Eagles. He wrote New Kid in Town and and a lot of those great wow. songs. And he's one of my best friends and a genius songwriter and a great singer. And I did get to do one album with him, which was a pleasure. It, 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 in terms of a particular story and memory, it was hard. It was complicated. It was long. John David is brilliant and and a, even a more perfectionist perhaps than I am. And and had some clear ideas and so did I. And we were working with a lot of amazing musicians, some jazz musicians, the cream of the crop of LA studio musicians and friends and and so on. And, you know, I think Linda sang on some of it and um, I can't remember, we had a lot of guest people on it. So I remember being quite complicated and, and long and fun because JD and I are terrific friends and had a great time doing it. But it was it was a it wasn't the fast one. I remember that it, it took some time, and we really tried to get it right. And I think we did. Uh, but the album did okay. It wasn't a smash. But it's I still run into people. It's it's you know it's got that vague kind of cult following thing where people go, you know, this is my favorite album of all time and stuff like that. Even though it wasn't a big hit, which is always nice to hear. That is nice to hear. And JD is still great, and, and he and I still talk often. Okay, so this is from Tim. He says, Peter, please tell us your recollections of the Aphex Oral Exciter that you were all over. <laughs> well, yes, it was the device that made things sound interestingly better. I mean, it, it, 
it was actually, uh, uh, I don't want to get too technical, but it, it was really just a phase shift of some kind. That, and it would give things a, a little sort of crispy edge and a little extra um, sort of intensity. And they, but they were a bit secretive about how it actually worked. And they implied that it did even more than it really did. And I think at the time, I think they first asked that they try and get like a royalty on the record if you used it, to which we said no. But I think one of the compromises was that we would credit it extensively. And so all the back of those records we used it on would say, this record was mixed using the Aphex Oral Exciter, which is a great <laughs> name, of course. Anyway, it really is. It was I a was cool afraid device. afraid to ask the question. <laughs> exactly. It was a cool device. We, we did use it. But on the other hand, when people go, oh, that record sounds terrific. It must have all been the Aphex Oral Exciter. Well, yeah. no. You know, that was probably an extra two or three percent on top of what, you know, I already had a great engineer doing a great mix and doing a wonderful job. And the Apex Oral Excited was one tool among several. And but yes, and because of the mysteriousness of it, mystery of it, and because it's such a cool name, people did at the time go, wow, what is that thing? How do I make my record sound like that? I better use an Apex Oral Exciter. Maybe my voice <laughs> will sound like Linda's. No, it won't, <laughs> you know, but, but we used it and it was cool. Wow, that is very cool. Um, okay, so let's see. So Marty would like to know, when I saw Jane in death at a funeral and recognized her straight off, what is she up to? You know what? I I should know exactly what she's doing at the moment. She she's working all the time as as an actor, and and uh, I don't actually know. I haven't talked to her for a few weeks, and I don't actually know what she's in the middle of doing. But I bet it's something good. She's doing something amazing, but I can't tell you what it is. No, I just I <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, but it's, you know, with an actor, the, the main question is, you know, is she working? Yes. <laughs> you know, because actors actors live in fear of of suddenly not working. Even the, even the big deal actors do. Wow. So Ed would like to know, today is the anniversary of the release of Rubber Soul. I did not oh. know that. Oh. That was, wait, where did my question go? It got bumped. That was the first album I ever owned. Can you share any stories uh, about the album or one of my favorite songs on it, Norwegian Wood? Well, uh, I don't think I was there hardly at all when they were making the album. I, I didn't visit the studio that much. Occasionally I did. So I don't think I have any special uh, recollections of the music being made. I do uh, remember, oddly enough, Paul being very excited about the cover um, because you know, that it would look now, it doesn't look particularly unusual, you know, because it would be so easy to create that effect digitally. But I do remember him bringing home printouts or whatever they weren't printouts or i guess they were mock-ups of mm. of the album cover in its early stage and explaining that they'd taken this picture and then they printed it by tilting the negative oh that was it it was you know whereas now it would be you'd put it through a something eyes a program app you know and get whatever effect you wanted but then somebody accidentally or on purpose or in an exploratory way um, lifted one corner or one side of the negative and, and instead of lying it flat like you normally would and, and shone the light through it and printed it that way. And that's why it's got that stretchy look, you know, which they, which gave it, of course, the exact rubbery effect that they thought would be right. And that's, uh, I don't know which came first, the effect <laughs> or the name, but they liked the idea of rubber sole, of course, because it's a pun and the, the English love puns. So they either had a rubber sole like a shoe would but it was also a kind of soulful music, but with this stretchy album cover. I, I, re I remember that Norwegian Wood uh, was exciting, obviously, because it was, I think, the first time we'd heard the sitar um, combined with pop music in that way. And it was such an odd song. Uh, the other thing is that uh, when the Pauls has said in interviews that when he wrote about the Norwegian Wood, and and the, it does it by the way the end of the song is indeed arson you know there's some people who ask me questions about they're going no 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 it's about lighting a joint or whatever no it's not it was about that this guy was pissed off he'd been made to sleep in the bath and so he set fire to our house which is rather drastic but um but paul did say that the norwegian wood part of it was based on some pine paneling 
that I had in my bedroom. But I don't remember actually having pine paneling. And I think he might be thinking of a room in the basement that was more of a sort of party room that we did put some pine in. But I remember Paul saying that, that it was some pine in our house and that there wasn't Norwegian at all. But he said the Norwegian wood just sounded a lot better than, than English pine. So he, he, he hit that, but he'd use that for the name of the song. So I remember more of the peripheral stuff than I do the actual sessions. Wow. That is a fantastic story. So I'm going to ask Rob's question for Rob. Um, yeah, for well, Rob, we couldn't. <laughs> I don't know what happened to Rob. Uh, um, okay. He could ask many questions, but this is what popped into his head. What is your first memory of Paul, and what was your initial impression of him? Did he strike you in a particular way? Oh, his browser blinked. Okay, so he's going to answer now. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I met, I think I met all the Beatles around the same time. Um, Jane had met them, you know, in the whole story when she'd gone to review a concert for a magazine and met them all. And I remember meeting them in a pub somewhere I, I, with Jane and met them all. I think, I don't think I met Paul separately or maybe I did by a few days, but, but and the, the thing is that, you know, I, and when I spoke to Paul, I, I, I found him very charming and clearly extremely clever and extremely musical. Um, the funny part about cliches is that, as, as you well know, they always have a basis in reality. I mean, you know, the, the reason they become cliches, to qualify as a cliche, you're automatically kind of a bit true always, I think. And the Beatle cliches are no exception to that rule. In other words, Paul was the charming, amiable, diplomatic one. George was the quiet one. John was the one who could be a little bit snarky if you rubbed him the wrong way, you know, and so on. And Ringo was the funny one. And, and uh, but of course, in the miracle is they, they combined so miraculously into, you know, a group that couldn't have been done better if, you, if they'd been cast like the Spice Girls, you know, if it had been like, oh, we'll have the posh one and the sporty one. And, you know, which of course was deliberate. In the Beatles case, it was entirely accidental that they just made this extraordinary blend of, of people who, who created, who fit as well together personality-wise as they did musically in a miraculous way. And they became, you know, such a tight unit for so long. But, um, so I think my, my first impressions was, were, were, yes, these people are as charming and, and clearly as brilliant because I'd heard the music by that time, uh, as as we all think they are. You know, they, the, it was all real. You know, they, they, they were and are extraordinary people. And and my impression of Paul was of charm and and, and amia, you know amiability. He was, you know, he knew how to, how to. He was nice with nice to our mother, and you know, knew knew how you do these things. You know, you get mum on your side, you're okay. You know, and <laughs> and uh, so that's that's I think I remember that's around the time we all met for the first time. Wow. So this question is from Nancy. She says. How, and I, I love this question because I have the same question. How do you manage to stay so kind and humble considering your amazing life experiences and achievements? What keeps you grounded? Well, maybe my sister's not the only actor in the family, you know? <laughs> you know say? I don't think I'm, gonna really, I'm not really that humble, but but thank you. Uh, um, I I stay grounded just by working, I think. I, I like to stay busy. Uh, I love music. You know, I'm involved with a lot of stuff. I, you know, I'm involved with the Recording Academy a lot. I've been a trustee of the Recording Academy and, and a member of the LA chapter. And so I take on lots of ventures um, and, uh, and and love new stuff. And, and and I think that, that if anything keeps you humble, that does. I mean, I was talking today, helping some people with this song that's from, from a movie um, called Nazarene. Um, I don't know if you know anything about her. She's the, Nazreen, gosh, I can't remember her second name now. She's this human rights uh, um, person in, in Iran who, and we just got the bad news today, they've now put her back in prison. She's been in prison uh, where she got COVID. She, she, she's, been, she's been working for human rights in Iran and women's rights in particular for years. And so I've, I've now thrown myself wholeheartedly into this project of trying to help uh, bring attention to her cause and make them release her because the Iranian right. government is, is pretty revolting and, and, uh, and so on. So, you know, I, I, 
I, and I mention that only in the sense that, you know, if somebody wants to talk to me about something like that, I, I, you know, that's important and that I can might be able to do something about because they've made a cool music video to go with the song and and they want to know how to how to help get it out and how to make people pay attention and so on. And I'm trying to help with with that. So I think staying busy is probably a very big part of it, you know, but I, I'm not sure how humble I really stay. <laughs> you know, I think I've done okay. I'm not pretending I didn't. <laughs> So, oh, Zagari Ratcliffe, Zagari, that's her last name, I think. No, uh, no? no that's it. Nazreen is her first name. Oh, Nazreen. Nazreen, N-A-S-R-I-N. Um, I'm sorry, I blanked on the name. If you, if you look up, I think that people are writing about the documentary already. Yep, yep they are. N -A -S is somebody finding it? Yes, I, I thought I found it. Nazreen. Nazreen, yes. Um, oh. So Duda, so so yeah, that's Tuda. a that's a that's yeah. a Satuda, I yep. think it was like that, yeah. Yes, here I'm gonna yeah. put the link in there. Read the link in that. And and the, the the documentary is coming, and it's it's fantastic. I just saw it last night. It's great. Oh, I can't wait. Um, so uh, unknown person. Oh, Ilana would like to know: Did you spend any time at the Night Owl where James Taylor started out? Yes, uh, I did. Uh, you know because. Uh, that's where he started with the band, I think, uh, with the band, the Flying Machine. But yes, he we he played there. When I came back, I actually spent some time in New York in Greenwich Village, uh, with an environment with which James was very familiar. And I went to the Night Owl and the. I think James played the Night Owl later on solo, as I recall. Certainly, we used to hang out there, and I think it's it's one of the early gigs we did that was quite small. And when he started to get big, so lots of people would show up. I remember a particular small place in New York, and I think it was the Night Owl, where, um, you know, this, we were James was getting very hot all of a sudden. They, they, you know, Sweet Baby James was out, and the buzz was all beginning. And they said, "Oh, can we move it to a to a larger place?" I think this was the Night Owl, somewhere like other Cafe War or one of those places. And and I said, "No, no, don't move it. You know, don't move it at all. Don't move it because I'd rather have a huge crowd trying to get into a small place, you know." And there was a <laughs> huge line outside, and I called the TV news and said, "Something's going on in McDougal Street. You know, I don't know what it is." And they, of course, they set cameras down and, and asked all the people what they were queuing for. So, so you know, it paid off. But yeah, I, I just spent some time in in Greenwich Village and 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 enjoyed it very much. It was a, a perfect time. Phil Oakes was a great friend of mine who was a stalwart of that scene and and you know at the time it was all about you know who's going to make it out of greenwich village and it might have been dave van ronk it might have been phil oaks it might have been bob dylan and of course bob dylan won that particular contest yes um so this is a question from mike he says hello peter bassist lee sklar speaks well of you on his daily videos what what have you to say about lee and the many sessions you did with him yeah he's amazing um i mean lee is a uh, of all the musicians I've worked with, he's a complete genius. He's like a, he was a child prodigy. He, he was a child prodigy on the piano and my other things. Then he was a drum major, you know, doing all the spinning the thing and all the tricks. Yes. My grandfather um, did that. <laughs> oh wow! He's a stunning musician. He can he can you know read and write like a champ, and he's one of the best bass players in, in the world. And also an incredibly cool guy. He has a book coming out actually. Come to think of it um now i think um he had he, it's it's a picture book he, he had oh. he has had this project uh, you should be able to look him up i don't even know the oh, yeah, i'm looking it up right now yeah he he started this collection years ago um asking everyone in, in he worked with to to take a picture for him of of themselves giving the the, the world the finger so this picture is is, <laughs> is 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 and he's got everybody all kinds of extremely famous interesting people almost nobody said no once he explained that this was his project and and uh, and i don't know if you're looking at the book now maybe you can I see am. it but the, all kinds of very interesting people have 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 been posed in that particular manner and and uh, and lee's got all of them what's it what's oh, it called wow. it's called everybody loves me there you go exactly yeah Filmed with unique and unexpected photos of over 6,000 celebrities and everyday people giving <laughs> the proverbial noodle finger. Exactly. Okay. So what do you think, Peter? Can we have him for an event? Will you be in conversation yeah. with him? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say the word. I'll, I'll okay. go. Um, 
No, that absolutely. Was, Tell me, if it's, okay. in all seriousness, if you want to reach Lee, just let me know. I'll put you in touch. Oh, definitely. That, that absolutely. Would be great because he, he has a lot of stories to tell and he, he pulls no punches. He, he'll tell you who he, who he doesn't like working with and who he does like working with. Thankfully, I'm, I'm still on the latter list at the moment, I think. But you never know. I could screw up. He played for me on this Kate Taylor record I just did. Oh, wow. Uh, um, I'm so glad you're still making music, Peter. That just... Yeah, that just no, it's... It's so much fun. You know, I, I worked, with, as I say, with Kate 50 years ago and we got invited to make another record together and said yes. And so all the same musicians, Danny Korchmar, Lee Sklar, Russ Kunkel, who played on that record 50 years ago, just played for me again last week with Kate, which was exciting. That is fantastic. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, uh oh, I lost his video, but I'm not sure if everyone else did. Okay, so Tom would like to know, can you hear me, Peter? Yes. Oh, yes, I can. Oh, okay. Talking? Great. Oh. I can't see you, but I think everybody else still can. You can't see um, me? So Tom would like to know. Oh. No, but I think it's just, oh, yeah, everybody else can. Uh, so Tom would like to know, he says, I loved your Peter and Albert and Peter and Jeremy shows. Ever consider a trio Peter, Albert, and Jeremy? Not till this very minute, but you never know. I mean, <laughs> uh, I'm kind of used to being a duo, you know, and the, obviously the Jeremy mm. thing, the whole idea was it was, you know, that that was sort of inevitable because it was Peter and Gordon and Chad and Jeremy and, you know, Gordon died, uh, Chad retired. And so we kind of looked at each other and went, well, you know, surely now the leftovers have to form a new duo. But of course, having Albert play with us would be spectacular he's one of the best guitar players in the entire universe by far i mean the the are different kinds of shows obviously the peter and al peter and jeremy uh is more uh has has video in it and stuff and it's more like a little produced show but me and albert is a little more folky it's just the two of us and and of course it's thrilling for me because i get to play rhythm guitar and sit and listen to albert lee solos and which are you know among the best in the world he also by the way played on this kate taylor record we just finished we had our guitar lineup was danny Korchmar, wadi wachtel and albert lee so it was pretty good and then lee scar on bass and and russ kunkel on drums and that'll be out um um uh, next year oh i see somebody found uh yeah there's a nice NPR story about Nazrin. Yep. I posted right. the link there in the chat. Great. So if Thank anyone you, yes. wants to read that article, um, it's really go important. ahead and click on the link. Yeah. That is excellent. Yeah, and, right. And Angelique Kijo, do you know who she is? Amazing African singer. No. Uh, Benin, I think. She's she's an amazing singer. And she sang the, the theme song that was written specifically by a couple of major writers in New York for, for this uh for this movie, for, for Nazarene, and uh, and Angelique is the, did a beautiful job singing it. So it's it's a it's an important project. That is that is amazing. Thank you for doing that. It's oh Bidley's oh thank you Ken. I couldn't find the book. Couldn't find what? Thank you. I couldn't find Lee's book. It was not available. I can't. I'm looking over for it. So he must just oh. be um, selling it himself. So oh. I'm gonna have to. Go on there. Yeah, I wonder work. how that works. I I don't actually know what, who's whether it has a publisher or what. Yeah, Maybe it's, I'm not sure. Maybe you, he self published you it, it somewhere, right? You, hmm? you you found it somewhere, but not for sale. Yes, Ken found it. So okay. Ken posted the link for me. So thank you, Ken. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, Lee, Lee's website is is fabulous anyway. But yeah, we should we should, we should we uh, should I'll find out what Lee's doing about that because she should be doing these things because he's yes. very funny. He's that would be so funny. much fun. Great. So here's a question from Shelly. She says, you and Gordon toured with Del Shannon. Is that how you acquired the ability to record I Go to Pieces, one of my favorite songs ever? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, and I agree. Uh, the honest truth is I think that may be my favorite Peter and Gordon record, even though What Without Love is the most important, of course, and it's a brilliant song. But I Go to Pieces is a, is a, a record of which I'm proud. What happened was we toured with Del Shannon in Australia. We were all on a, a tour down under with ourselves, Del Shannon, and another British band called The Searchers, who you may remember, very good band. Del Shannon had written the song, I Go To Pieces, and I found out later it actually played it to several people in America before he left for Australia, and no one wanted to do it. 
they politely declined. And then when he was on the road with us, uh, he wanted the searchers to do it. He thought they would do it very well, which by the way, I think he's right about the searchers did everything with that jangly electric 12 string sound that was so cool. I think they could have made a great record if I go to pieces and Dell actively tried to sort of sell it to them. Um, and they turned it down also. They didn't think it was quite right for them. We had overheard Dell singing it to them. And so I had to overcome my chagrin at the fact that we were clearly very far from being Dell's first choice to do, to do the song. But but uh, we said, we really like that song. You know, could we work up a version of it? Would that be okay? And he said, of course you can. And we did out there on the road down under and and uh, it started to sound pretty good. So I said to Dell, uh, please don't give it to anybody else. As soon as we get back to London, we will go into EMI Studios, now Abbey Road, and, and record it. And that's what we did. And it was a, a, a big hit, I'm happy to say. Yes. All right, here's a question from Anne Marie. Did you and the Beatles regularly hang out with the other big name bands in the 60s? Can you talk about that scene? Was there competition among these bands or was it one big party? I know what my guess is. Uh, both is actually the correct answer. Uh, it, it was one big party. We didn't hang out with each other a lot. We ran into each other a lot because, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there were only certain TV, TV shows that you'd all do at the beginning when even the Beatles were doing the same regular TV promotion shows. Thank Your Lucky Stars, Ready, Steady, Go. Um, I'm forgetting a big one. But, um, uh, you know, we would run into each other on those shows because there'd be a bunch of bands and sometimes even run into each other on the road, of course, because back then tours all had five or six act, acts on them in America as well. I remember doing the Murray the K show, Brooklyn Fox show at the Murray the K. It was five shows a day. And if you were doing really well, you got to do two songs. And if you're on your first hit, you only got to do one. But there was a lot of hanging out. And you find, you know, we did one with the Moody Blues on it and Wilson Pickett. It was a broadly based mixture and, and very exciting. And yes, we also all used to hang out in the same clubs in London. There was the Scotch of St. James. There was the Bag of Nails. There was the Adlib. There were a bunch of, you know, uh, clubs where, you know, there's a lot of drinking and tomfoolery going on and and everyone would hang out together. That's, you know, we've, where we first, mostly of us first heard Jimi Hendrix when he first came to London. He, he was sitting in in those kind of clubs and word rapidly spread, you know, there's a, there's a new guy in town, you know. So, uh, but yes, it was also competitive. Of course it was. You know, we uh, the Beatles rapidly, of course, excluded themselves from that competition by entering a whole other, you know, magical class of, of musical brilliance and stardom. So they didn't have to worry about competing. That that fight, that fight That discussion was over, you know. But the, and the Rolling Stones pretty much had a lock on the number two slot, you know. But, but <laughs> between all the rest of us, was it competitive? Yes, it was as well as a lot of fun. Wow. A good time was had by all, as they say. Excellent. I, I can't even, I've seen Jimi Hendrix for the first time. Well, I saw it. Well, my well, mind. well the, the, there were two times like that for me, if I'll tell the story briefly, but so yes. you hear dog barking in the background. Um, the, we saw him first when he just arrived in London and was sitting in with people. I mean, it was just a crazily good guitar player who everyone wanted to see. But then he disappeared for a bit, and that's when his manager, Chaz Chandler, his name was, who was also the bass player in The Animals, a fine band on, on their own. He, he discovered Jimi Hendrix, and <coughs> he took him away for a bit, and then that's when he put the Jimi Hendrix experience together. Um, and when I first heard them, that was a particularly fantastic story. Which, um, if we've got time, I'll tell one more story. The, um, because, Brian Epstein, at the time, the Beatles manager, obviously, had just bought a theater called the Savile Theater in London because he wanted to put on shows. And he would do a show, I think it was every Sunday night or something, I don't remember. And he had various acts play, usually two or three acts in a night. And he had arranged to be the first performance by the Jimi Hendrix Experience after Mitch and Noel had become part of the package and the whole thing had been put together by Chaz. Um, with the songs chosen and a record made and all that. And now when, when you know, every theater in London, all those beautiful old theaters, there's always a royal box 
which is held, it's a sort of luxury box held for whatever member of the royal family may choose to attend, especially, of course, the Queen. And come the Jimi Hendrix concert, inexplicably, Her Majesty had not yet expressed any interest in attending the first Jimi Hendrix concert. So that meant that it was up to Brian who was in the box. It was there for, then in his box. And the Beatles uh, and, and I had, had heard about it, so about, about Jimi. So I got to the pleasure of being in the royal box with the Beatles, there were only about six of us in the box altogether. They're quite small. And and uh, we got to see Jimi Hendrix for the very first time uh, anywhere, which was pretty extraordinary because he was doing the whole full on, you know, playing with his tongue and the fire, setting fire to his guitar and, and you know, the crazy outfits and Mitch and Noah were an amazing band. And on top of it all, this was the week that Sergeant Pepper had just come out. And Jimi Hendrix had heard it on the radio for the first time the day before, learned it, and opened a show with a Jimi Hendrix version of it. Wow. So entirely blowing everyone's minds because, you know, I don't even sure if you could buy copies of it. I, I suppose you could. He couldn't have just, well, he could actually, being him, but I've just learned it by listening to the radio, but he might have. But um, he'd worked out this killer version with almost no rehearsal with the experience, like running it at sound check or something, and opened the show with it, causing go to Paul and John, of course, complete collapse because they had, didn't expect it and had no idea. And of course, it was an amazingly good, cool version. So that's a night I do remember with with some affection. Wow, that that is incredible. What a <laughs> it's here sitting in the royal box with the Beatles watching Jimi yeah. Hendrix. Yeah, exactly. It's a pretty that's, good combo. <laughs> that's what it was. That's that's pretty that's pretty incredible. So we're gosh, we've been hogging up, just taking up so much of your time. Um, let's can we do one last question? Of course, whatever you want. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. I need to pick a good one. Oh, someone's talking about how cool Lee Scar is. Yes, he's extremely interesting and approachable guy. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay, so here's Jan, Jan baby. We're gonna, I'm gonna invite Jan. We're gonna try this one more time. We're gonna invite okay, Jan good. on the screen, Jan Barrett. So we're gonna see if this works and then we'll close out the event with Jan's question. Okay. There she is. Oh, great. Hello. Oh, is it Hi, John? Jan. Hi, Peter's my old boss. Oh, it's that Jan. I thought it was. I <laughs> <laughs> nice That's to see so you. Cool. How are you? How are you guys? Oh, great. Yeah, thank you for doing this. This is awesome. Welcome. Awesome. It's the first time th since COVID started that I've done one of these. I'm lucky that I'm, you know, that I could do it. Like, yeah. <laughs> you got on the scene so fast. It's great to see you. That's, it's great to see you. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, so I wanted to ask you, how'd you meet Eric? Eric Barrett. Eric Barrett. He was recommended to me by Nat Weiss. Oh, I don't okay. know how Nat knew him. Nat, must, Nat Weiss was uh, uh, the, a, a remarkable man with an incredible history. He's worth looking up as well. But he ended up being the Beatles lawyer in America, uh, working closely with Brian Epstein. He was also a friend of mine. He became uh, James Taylor's lawyer as well. He somehow, when I was putting, was first putting a major James Taylor tour together, with the minute we'd left the club level behind and we were moving up to auditoriums and arenas and i needed a, a tour manager uh, um, and it turned out eric was an experienced tour manager including by the way having worked for jimmy hendrix yeah that's, that's where i yeah. thought you met him yeah uh no i didn't meet him he, he told me immediately so, but that isn't when i met him no oddly enough it would it would it would might but you know no nat knew him through someone and recommended him to me uh, Nat died a few years back now, but um, he was an amazing guy and, and you know, yeah. uh, one of the people to whom I owe a debt who taught me a lot about the business. And also he was, was Brian's best friend in New York and that's where Brian used to spend all his time uh, with Nat. But anyway, so uh, he recommended Eric to me and Eric turned out to be a brilliant tour manager and a great lighting designer as well. And I haven't seen him for, for a bit. Have you seen him? I, him? I did see him a couple of years ago and uh so he's doing well and he got remarried yeah i heard that anyway yeah, we don't his mean wife to... is wonderful what a, yeah beautiful right. excellent well thank I you for that great question I didn't, I didn't mean to suddenly get start having a private phone conversation on oh, yeah, yeah. 100 people. <laughs> Sorry, Eric. 
No, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's good to see you. Nice to hear about Eric. Yeah, good to see you. I'll see, I'm sure I'll see, you, I'll see you once this COVID stuff is under control. Exactly. Thanks, Jen. Right. Take yes. care. Cheers. Can't wait. Well, that was super fun. And he also had some Norwegian wood on his wall. As well. That's right. He did. He absolutely did. I guarantee you that's authentic Norwegian. I can tell. <laughs> it's dated. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, well, thank you so much, Peter. This has been just... No, it's been... It's I feel been like it feels like the year kind of started in March and now we're, so we've started and ended this with you and now we're just going to move on. If I missed anybody out, um, my e the best email to get me at is Peter Asher at SiriusXM.com. That's the, obviously the Sirius XM address. And, and I always check that for, and, and, and I do reply to every email. So if I, if I missed anybody out and have anything else that I need to need to say or anything, any particular questions that require an answer. I'm yes, to, a lot of great I'm questions. Happy to answer emails. Peter Asher at SiriusXM.com. Excellent. And everyone go ahead and click that green button down below. I'm going to put the list together and send it to Peter and He's going to yep. get signing those book plates. I've got a big He's stack of uh, book plates that look like. Yes, I, we have plenty can, of books. You can't see that, can you? So, mm. yes, that would be a great yeah. gift. No, it looks. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh excellent. It says, with the compliments of the author and my name at the bottom. But of course, it's, oh, all, in, it's all in looking glass writing. One yeah. forget. <laughs> that is anyway, excellent. Yes, that's so, what they'll look like. And I have a big stack of them, and we'll, we'll sign them as required. And right. and thank you so much. It's great to be doing this again. It was really fun and yes. a pleasure and to see you and everything. Excellent. Thank you so much, you. Peter. Your questions were great yeah. and the fan questions were great. So so thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks everyone for joining us and um take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye all. <laughs>